Let's open our Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 35 again, where we'll start at verse number 20 in a bit. I thought that it might be helpful if we talked a little bit about the geopolitics of the Middle East, which were contributing factors to the sudden death of King Josiah. We know that the Assyrian Empire had dominated the Middle East uh, during the, the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel and had even threatened the southern kingdom of Judah and done great damage to many of the other nations around it. I have told you multiple times that you should kind of think of the Assyrians as the Nazis of their day. They considered themselves the, the super people. They were the, the direct creation of the god Ashur, and everyone else was just a resource to be used. Well, the Assyrian Empire kind of fell apart starting right around 627 BC when uh, one of their long-term kings died. And it wasn't just him that died in 627. It was also the, the Assyrian puppet leader of the Babylonian province of the Assyrian Empire that died shortly after that. And there was a man by the name of Nabopolassar who saw this as an opportunity to secure the independence of the Babylonian peoples. And so he declared himself to be the new king of Babylonia in 626 BC. And it would appear around that same time that he designated his son, a man that we will know very well, Nebuchadnezzar, as a priest in that new kingdom. Well, the Assyrians were not happy about this vie for independence, and so they tried to uh, put down this rebellion and failed. And then that contributed to the province of Elam, deciding that maybe they wanted their independence from Babylon. And so they started being a problem. Or, see, not from Babylon, but from Assyria. And so they started being a problem as well. And then there was an Assyrian commander off in the west who decided that maybe he could be the new leader. And he even attacked Nineveh. So things started becoming very unstable in the Assyrian Empire. And this allowed Nabopolassar, the new king of Babylon, to really free up the Babylonian province completely. But once he got that done in the beginning of the 600 teens BC, by then, he decided that maybe Babylon should be the ruler of the entire upper Middle East. And so he began pushing northward toward Nineveh. And uh, that all started happening about 616 BC. And he's moving up the river, uh, the Balik River, uh, where uh, he can approach Nineveh uh, during those years. And that's his first invasion of unique non-Babylonian territory, the Assyrian Empire itself. And uh, he keeps getting these victories over and over and over again in the six teens, the 600 teens. Uh, the Egyptians see this as a threat to the balance of power. Uh, they throw in with the Assyrians against the Babylonians. Uh, in around uh, 612 or so, uh, that's when Nineveh falls. The capital city of the Assyrian Empire is destroyed. And so they move their operations to Haran, uh, a couple of hundred miles to the west. Uh, this is the Haran where uh, Tira, the father of 
Abram had died and where Abram had spent a little bit of time. And so the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar start attacking that city. And they've also got assistance from uh, the Medes, who are also tired of uh, everything that's been going on with the Assyrians. Well, uh, that ends up with uh, the Egyptians trying to come in and assist in holding out against the Babylonians and the Medes. And there's nothing but defeat for this Assyrian-Egyptian alliance. Until finally, uh, they move their operations to Carchemish, uh, about 60 or so miles uh, west of Haran on the Euphrates River. And so that's where we now pick up the story with Judah getting involved, because the scripture says, 2 Chronicles 35, 19, or excuse me, 35, 20, after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, that's a reference to everything he'd done earlier in his reign, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates, and Josiah went out to meet him. So we can only guess what was going through Josiah's head that he didn't like the Assyrians, more than likely. And since the Egyptians were trying to help the Assyrians out, why should he allow them to pass through his territory and provide that assistance to the Assyrians? So Josiah, in 609 BC, blockades the Megiddo Plain, uh, just north of the Megiddo Pass, uh, to stop the Egyptian forces from advancing northward. And verse 21 says, He, meaning uh, Pharaoh Necho, sent envoys to him saying, What have we to do with each other, king of Judah? I'm not coming against you this day, but against the house with which I am at war. So he tells Josiah, this is not about Judah. I am not here to do anything against you or your kingdom. I'm just passing through to assist my ally and to fight against the Babylonians. Then he throws in this bit that we talked briefly about yesterday. And God has commanded me to hurry. Cease opposing God who is with me, lest he destroy you. So Nico says that he has had divine instructions to go to Carchemish. And he probably is functioning under this idea that uh, there's this one God that is the God of everyone. And therefore, the God of Judah, uh, known by the name of Yahweh, uh, is the same God down in Egypt that told him to go and fight at Carchemish. So he feels that just telling Josiah, you're getting in God's way, is enough information. Now the question naturally arises, did God tell Nico to go to Carchemish? Well, if he did... He certainly didn't tell him to go there to assist the Assyrians because once he gets there, he will be defeated soundly and will have to return uh, with his tail tucked between his legs. So if God did tell him to do it, it was in the same situation that we saw God telling uh, Ahab that he should go and fight uh, because he wanted Ahab dead. And so in this case, uh, if God was involved, he wanted Egypt weakened further uh, by their defeat at Carchemish. Uh, but as far as Josiah is concerned, uh, he doesn't care. He, he doesn't believe that he should allow Nico and the Egyptian military to pass through, so he refuses to back off. I wish 
that he had checked in with God. Because what happens next would not have necessarily had to happen if he'd checked in with God and God told him, yes, I do want Nico to go to Carchemish, get out of his way. And Josiah would have lived longer, and the story of the end of Judah would have been at least slightly different. It wouldn't have stopped the fact that they were going to go into Babylonian exile, uh, because that's already been set in stone uh, by God's judgment uh, being passed on through prophets already. But we can only deal with what happened. So here's what happened. Verse 22, Nevertheless, Josiah did not turn away from him, but disguised himself in order to fight with him. So he, instead of wearing his royal robes and remaining as kind of the command center for the military operation, he actually puts on common uh, commanding clothes of like a soldier, of, a, of a, an officer, if you will, and he goes and gets into the fight himself in a chariot. Uh, he did not listen to the words of Nico from the mouth of God. There's a prophet that's giving this idea that God was definitely involved in this. Nico was supposed to meet his fate of defeat at Carchemish. And so uh, Josiah is unfortunately fighting against God. So he came to fight in the plain of Megiddo, and the archers shot King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am badly wounded. So he is hit by arrows, and he knows that it's bad. And he asks his uh, driver to get him out of the middle of the battle, perhaps to try to seek some aid, but it is a mortal wound. So his servants took him out of the chariot, the battle chariot, and they carried him to his second chariot, perhaps a more high-speed chariot. And they brought him to Jerusalem, uh, which from Megiddo in a chariot, that's going to be a a good long day's travel, uh, maybe even a couple of days. But he doesn't make it. Uh, He died, and then he was buried in the tombs of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. They mourned for him because he was the great king. He was the one that brought everyone to Jerusalem for the great Passover of 622. But now he's dead. Verse 25, Jeremiah, who you remember is the last great prophet of the kingdom of Judah. Uh, Jeremiah also uttered a lament for Josiah. Uh, Josiah was about 38 years old when this happened, so he's not very old at all. I'm guessing Jeremiah is somewhere around that same age. And so Jeremiah the prophet grieves along with the rest of Israel, uh, 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 Judah and Jerusalem, over the loss of this great king. All the singing men and singing women have spoken of Josiah in their laments to this day. They made this a rule in Israel. Behold, they are written in the laments. Uh, So this makes reference to some writing and some songs that we do not necessarily have anymore. Uh, The writer of Chronicles at this point, is probably someone that went into exile during the Babylonian exile. And so he is writing with a 2020 hindsight of the death of Josiah led to the slide into judgment which ended Judah and Jerusalem's independence uh, and even the temple's destruction and Jerusalem's destruction. Uh, So great grief over the loss of this man, and that's why I wanted to come back and spend a little bit more time talking about him and how his death in the midst of this 
geopolitical environment sealed the swift fate of the southern kingdom of Judah. Verse 27 says, And uh, his acts, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And so that uh, finishes his uh, reign. Now, at this point, we need to talk about who came to power next. Chapter 36, verse 1. The people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's place in Jerusalem. Uh, Now, he is not the eldest son. He is apparently son number two. Verse two, Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. Now, why do they make him king rather than his older brother? I'm going to give you what I consider the best guess, and that is because the older brother was probably pro-Egyptian and therefore pro-Assyrian. And they didn't want someone that had the opposite attitude of the great king Josiah, uh, who was uh, wanting to see Assyria fall completely uh, to the uh, Babylonians. Uh, So, Son number one was probably much more like dad in that respect, so they would not put him on the throne. Now, what happens? Um, In the fourth month, the fourth Jewish month of 609 BC, uh, we're talking about uh, in June, uh, Nico arrives up at Haran area, and he attacks uh, the, uh, the forces of the Babylonians that are there. Remember, he was going to kind of disrupt this whole transfer of power from Haran to Carchemish. And uh, the Assyrians and the Egyptians get beat. The Egyptians get beat badly. And so in the sixth month, of that same year, which would be uh, just a couple of months later, Nico has to retreat. And he comes back through Judea with his tail tucked between his legs, and uh, he finds out that it is an anti-Egyptian king that's on the throne. And so verse 3 of 2 Chronicles 36 happens. Then the king of Egypt deposed him in Jerusalem and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. So several things that are happening here. He wants this pro-Babylonian guy gone. And he also wants to make up for some of the financial investment that he's lost uh, in this recent fight that he's been in. So he penalizes Judah uh, with this tribute tax. And then he puts his own guy on. Verse 4, the king of Egypt made Eliakim, his brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem, changed his name to Jehoiakim. But Nico took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. So he takes the guy that the Judeans actually wanted on the throne off to Egypt, where he's going to die. And he puts the eldest son of Josiah on the throne because he's willing to be a vassal to the Egyptians. Uh, He changes his name. Uh, which is interesting here because he changes his name to be more specific as to Yahweh as God. Rather than just El, which is God generically in Hebrew, he 
changes that first component of the name to Yah, uh, which is very specific to he who is. Uh, why he does that, I don't know. It may be that he is totally convinced uh, that Yah is the God that's involved in all of these things happening in the Middle East right now. Verse number five, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign. So since this was only three months later, that's how we know the older brother was passed over for brother number two to start with, because here this guy is older than the first guy that was put on the throne. And he remains in power for 11 years. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of he who is his God. And so he is trouble uh, when he comes to the throne uh, because he is not like his father, uh, Josiah. Uh, he is much more like um, the other peoples uh, in leadership uh, that we've been reading about in the prophecies uh, that are becoming more and more like the Canaanites, more and more like the peoples around them and abandoning the worship of the true God. At this point, uh, we need to go over to uh, Jeremiah's prophecies. Jeremiah chapter number two uh, is where we're going to find some things that happen in the beginning of Jehoiakim's reign. So Jeremiah chapter 2 says, The word of he who is came to me, saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, thus says he who is. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown, so God, through the prophet Jeremiah, is lamenting with the people of Judah their change in attitude since he first started working with them as a nation. When he took them out of Egypt through the wilderness. And back then, they were following God. Verse 3. Israel was holy to he who is the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares he who is. Now, the metaphor changes at this point that Israel as a whole, now Judah is the only remnant of it, was like this field that was special to God. And Anyone who went in there and stole from it, that is, tried to do things to Israel, God brought disaster on them. Verse 4, Hear the word of he who is, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says he who is, What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me? and went after worthless, and became worthless. So God says, what has happened? What changed that your people, the people that followed me in the wilderness, the people that were my special field, have now abandoned me so that they could chase after these worthless idols and therefore make themselves worthless? Verse number six. They did not say, where is he who is, who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in the land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land where none passes through, where no one dwells. So he says, how come when trouble came in recent times, you didn't come to me? and look for me, the one who took you out of Egypt and through the wilderness. Verse 7, I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things, but when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. So it, we're looking at the history of Israel, 
how they got into the promised land and immediately they started abandoning the true God. And uh, this was an abomination. The priest didn't say, where is he who is? Those who handle law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. So God is saying, how is it that even those in leadership, spiritual leadership, abandoned me? Verse 9, therefore, I still contend with you. The word contend here is the idea of a lawsuit. We've seen this in other prophetic literature, that God is bringing a lawsuit against, in this case, Judah, for all the things they've done wrong against the covenant. And a lawsuit with your children's children, I will contend. For cross to the coasts of Cyprus and see, or send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? So you, you look at all the other nations around here. Did they abandon their national gods? That's certainly not the case with Ashur. For the Assyrians, they continued to worship him all the way down to their decline. And yet, here is Judah. My people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares he who is. For my people have committed two evils. They forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that hold no water. So the Israelis have not just simply abandoned God, they have embraced other gods and goddesses rather than the one who saved them out of Egypt.